Welcome to Campbellsville Baptist Church. I'm Brad Lauer, the Discipleship Pastor, and it's just a joy to be with you today as we continue our study in John, looking at uh, the Gospel of John and, and seeing what God has in store for us to teach us, to mold us, to um, challenge us, to encourage us with in His Scripture. We're going to be in John chapter 2 today uh, as we continue this study. So if you have your, your Bible and you want to turn to John chapter 2, if you want to take notes, whatever you want to do, just get ready. We'll pray and, and we'll jump right into the Scripture. God, we thank you for today and um, for everything that you have done in our lives, to be the grace that you've given us, the mercy, and most of all, for salvation. And God, may we live today as if we're in heaven and not wait, but live today. Guide us in our study today that we will honor and glorify you in all that we learn and all that we say and all that we uh, think through in the in process. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue this study, let's, um, let's look at some objectives that we're going to have today uh, in this during our study and our time together. One is, since Jesus has come to reveal himself as the Messiah through signs, the miracles he performs and, and he, the claims he makes give, a, gives, give us evidence on which to base our decision to follow him or reject him. Remember, Jesus is polarizing. Jesus is not the middle of the road, make everybody feel good kind of person. To follow Jesus, you either follow Jesus or you don't. You're either for him or you're against him. You love him or you hate him. There's no middle ground when it comes to your relationship with Jesus. We can't ride the fence. We, you know, he says in um, Revelation, if you're lukewarm, you're worthless because you're not any good for anybody. Neither hot nor cold. You. Jesus is either or. It's not both and. It's not a middle of the road thing. Also, to understand that, that the signs Jesus performs are symbols that reveal more and more about who he is. Also, to feel the joy in life that Jesus wants you and I to have by following after him with all of our heart, no matter our past. And to open ourselves up to receive and experience more of Jesus through trusting obedience. Okay, let me ask you a question. What's the most memorable wedding experience that you've ever had? Was it a funny thing? Did somebody pass out, even though that's not funny, but uh, somebody pass out? Did the pastor um, drop the rings, which I've done? Or was there just something fun at the reception or something really cool about the wedding? You know, weddings are a significant rite of passage for every cultural, every culture and or people group. And John 2 opens up with such a scene of a feasting, a, a scene of feasting and celebration. It's at a wedding in Cana where Jesus does something quite extraordinary. You know, chapter 2, as we get ready to read it, opens with Jesus' first sign and his miracles. Throughout the book of John, during Jesus' ministry, he repeatedly performs specific signs. Those signs, they act as symbols and tell us a story and gives us information about who Jesus is. As we examine the first sign at the wedding in Cana, we want to answer this question. What is Jesus telling us about himself with this particular sign? Many of us often get the impression that following Jesus means a life devoid of fun or, or celebration. Look at churches. They have more don'ts than they do do's. Don't do this. Don't do that. Sit down, be quiet, listen, don't have any fun. <laughs> Some, not all churches, but I, I remember growing up, that's kind of the whole thought process. That When I was in the youth ministry growing up, we had fun, but we just couldn't have fun in the building. We couldn't do anything crazy in the buildings. We had to go either outside or off location. Yet Jesus not only attends this wedding with his family and friends, he also ends up saving the party, you know, we tend to, to view Jesus as God, but we need, we need to remember that he was also fully human. Like us, he experienced the milestones, the memories, and joys of life. At this wedding, Jesus reveals much more about himself and his, in his first miracle. Before we read the text, let's talk about what the wedding feast was going to be. A biblical wedding, a Jewish wedding during that time and period in history was in, in so what Matthew 22, 2 through 10 talks about is Jesus compares the wedding feast to the kingdom of heaven. This is how important the wedding feast was. In Revelation 19, 6 and 9, the wedding is 
um, comparable to the marriage of the Lamb, the bride ready in pure bright linen. In Re Revelation 21, 1 through 5, we see where God will dwell with his bride forever. He will wipe away every tear. The former things have passed away, and all things will become new. Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. A wedding feast is of rich food, well aged wine, well refined wine, death swallowed up forever, and tears wiped away. In other words, a wedding. It's a celebration. It's a party. It's a feast. It's very joyful, a gathering of love and commitment. A wedding is a significant symbol that points to the kingdom of God as well. This makes Jesus' choice of location for his first miracle especially meaningful. He is looking ahead. So let's go ahead and jump into the text. John chapter 2, we're going to start verses 1 through 5. On the third day, a wedding took place at Canaan in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They've no more wine. Jesus replied, Well, woman, why, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Okay, so mom comes in. They're all at this wedding having a great time. The, they run out of their, their beverages. And, and, and so Mary, being mom, being knowing Jesus, is anxious. She doesn't want this party to fail. She doesn't want the family to be embarrassed by running out of wine. You know, moms tend to worry about all the details when it comes to a celebration, a party, they, they worry and they fret and they, 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 they want to make sure everybody is having a good time and, and make allowances for everyone. And so what could she do? All she could do was go to Jesus. And Jesus said, well, well wait a minute. My hour's not come. In other words, I'm not supposed to be revealed yet. People are not supposed to know exactly who I am. In other words, he's also talking about my hour's not come. My death has not come. This whole wedding illustration, metaphor, is not ready yet because the end party, the end celebration comes when Jesus conquers death and pays for all of our sins. Sometimes we look for glory based on our time when God wants us to serve based on his time and he will take care of the glory in his own time. Let's go on to verse 6 to 11. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing. In other words, making sure you're clean to enter the, the residence, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. So they weren't little jugs. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned to wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. All right, so the instructions were simply given. Go fill the jars with water. That's it. These were purification jars meant for cleaning, ceremonial cleaning or washing or purifying. Jesus, the Jews had gone, had to go through a process to atone for their sins. On the day of atonement, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies and meet with God to atone for the sin of the people. Animals were sacrificed. Blood would cleanse the animals were sacrificed. Blood would cleanse the people from their sin. So to use these jars, Jesus makes a statement about the way He will atone for our sins. And I want you not to miss this point. Obedience is the focus here. Sometimes when Jesus tell, tells us to do something, it just won't make sense. We'll go fill up these jars with water. Well, how that? How is that going to help? wine for this ceremony don't you know you have to go get the, the grape and this and that and the process of making wine and it just doesn't make sense but it doesn't have to if jesus is the one giving the instruction so why is it important for us even today to obey even when we don't understand god's methods or 
his plan. We don't under we don't we want to know the end game before we take the first step. A lot of times, many times with God, we don't we never know the end game. We just know we have to be obedient at this point in our lives. We may not know the end result. We may never see the end result, but we have the responsibility to take that step of faith, that step of obedience, whatever that looks like. Because we have to trust that God has a master plan, that God has a bigger plan than we can ever comprehend. Sometimes we wait for a miracle. Right? Sometimes, all right, God, show me who you are. Okay, God, fix this. Okay, God, do that. But sometimes God is waiting for us to move first to see if we're truly trusting Him or if we just want a fix-it God or if we're willing to put in some sweat equity ourselves. When the master of the feast tastes this wine Jesus created, he doesn't know where it came from. He doesn't know. And surprise, he whispers to the bridegroom, you kept the good wine until now. So let's just make a couple assumptions here, a couple points. What, whatever Jesus touches or whatever Jesus does or whatever Jesus offers, hear this, is always the best let me repeat that whatever jesus touches or whatever he does or offers is always the best why would many believers admit that they have not experienced the best of jesus in other words if you're a born again believer if you've accepted jesus christ as your lord and savior why aren't you showing that in your life if you're not that he is the best just as in the case with the wine at the feast some of the greatest thing god's going to do in our lives won't be on the front end. It wasn't at filling the jars. It was when it was tasted. There was a process of the carrying up the obedience. But it's going to be on the back end. So is there something God is asking you to do now in obedience to Him? You know, when we step out in faith or step out in faithful obedience, even when it does not make immediate sense to us, God will reveal more and more of Himself to us and to the world around us. Sometimes God wants us to take a step. He'll reveal a little more, and, that's, and we go farther and farther down that road with Him, and we see more and more of His plan. <clears throat> we see the supernatural come into the natural. We have to remember we're also invited to partner with all God is doing. Remember, in a, if you've ever done Experiencing God um, by Henry Blackaby, um, he says, figure out what God is doing somewhere and then go get in the middle of it. Too many times we say, God, come over here and bless me doing this. When that is not God's plan, we need to look for God's movement and God's plan and be a part of it. So we are invited to partner with God. Everything that He's doing, our faith in Him will grow the more and more we're obedient. And we, be, we come to believe in Him and receive a fuller experience of Him. All right, let's keep going. Let's go start in verse 13. Well, it says in 12, After this, He went down to Capernaum with His mother and brothers and disciples. There they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove them all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he was spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken 
So the stage is set. He walks into the temple. It's time for the time for the Passover. Jesus was a good Jewish person. He did the rituals and the rites. But, and he walks in and he sees his father's house, the temple, which was made to worship, to commune with God, to, to give to God, turn into a marketplace. You see, people had to have something to sacrifice. People had to have something to, to put on the altar. People had to have the right kind of money to buy the goods. So they had exchange tables and they were selling products so that people could get whatever they needed to be able to make their sacrifice during the Passover. But they were making profits. They were doing unethical business practices, as it's alluded to here. They had, they had changed the purchase of purpose of worship, of coming to, to the house of the Lord, to fit a human need and desire. So, well, they're coming in, they have to sacrifice, so let's start setting up shop. Have you seen that other places? Have you seen that outside of ball? This is a poor example, but it's, it's one that makes sense. You know, you go to, let's say you go to um, um, the Super Bowl or you go to um, the National Championship football game or whatever, um, and you see it at, at baseball stadiums. I used to see it when I was a kid. Well, you knew that there are um, um, goods and services on the inside of the, the gate or the, the arena or the fence as you walk in, as you pay your money or you give your ticket. You know that there are um, concessions inside. You know there are places to buy clothing, team apparel, uh, those kind of things. But what happens is people set up right outside the gate and they sell their goods and services just off, pro off property thinking that you'll buy them for cheaper. They can make a buck off people, so on and so on. So that's what's, what's happening at the church or at the temple. There are all... But in reverse order, there were places all through town that you could buy animals to make a sacrifice because many Jews came from a long distance and it was too hard to bring cattle or sheep or goats or doves or whatever that kind of distance. So they just brought their money and then they bought something when they got there. And so instead of buying out in the town, they, they probably made some rule, I don't know for sure, where you had to buy, the, these are the only clean ones or pure ones that you could buy. And so they set up a racket on the inside of the wall of the temple. Just to get, so they have changed the meaning of what goes on in God's house. Because worship is fellowship with God. It's not all this other stuff. It's fellowship. It's praise and honor and adoration and, and laying your life down at His feet. This is even a great modern day illustration of how broken humanity has become. Rather than seeking fellowship and friendship with God, we're using Him for our own selfish gain and as a means to an end. And churches can do that if we're not careful. Because of our sin, our default is to use God rather than seek fellowship with Him as the goal, the true end gain. In order for us to experience God rightly, God must give us new hearts, hearts that desire fellowship with Him. At the root of everything, when we turn our lives over to Jesus and we make that commitment, we should have a new heart, a new heartbeat that only beats for things of God and wanting to commune with God. Now, does that mean we sit inside a building or a room and we worship all day? And No. But it means every breath we breathe in and out, we're using our life to be an expression of our relationship with God. We can't compartmentalize our relationship with God. We can't put it aside just because we're doing business. It ought to infiltrate each and every decision we make. We have to make smart, wise decisions for our households or for our businesses or for uh, raising our children. But God has to be the filter everything goes through and not just used over here for this and for that. You know, Jesus drives him out with a whip. He claims to destroy and raise it up in three days. In other words, he will defeat death. The temple was God's dwelling place. In John 1, we learn that Jesus was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God, and so on, and so on, and so on. And he came to dwell with us. For the first time in history, 
a building, a tent, an altar, was no longer needed to meet with God. I can meet with God driving down the road. I can meet with God sitting at my desk. I can worship God sitting on a mower or refinishing a bathroom or um, painting a wall or playing golf. I don't have to confine my worship. I don't have to confine my time with God just to my quiet room, my quiet time space, or my office or the worship center, I can do it anywhere. And in Him, we find fellowship with God. How Do you spend your life living it as though you have no access to God directly? We don't live under those rules anymore. Don't have to go through someone else to have direct access to God. We have that once we become a child of God. Because remember, God does not see me or God does not see you. God sees Jesus. So he is having a conversation with his son or daughter. We go on in John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all the people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. So he's performed the, the signs at the wedding. Now he's performed signs here in the temple. Set made a lot of claims. And so people were starting to believe in him. He's starting to get a gathering, a crowd, a, a group of followers. But what he realized and what he knew, because he is God, but many did not. And he didn't trust himself to them because he knew their hearts. Some were just following the show. And some were acting like they were believing, but not necessarily fully committed. The people were not ready to fully experience Jesus. It is a process that takes time to know him more and more each day day it's a process but it's either hot or cold you're either all in or you're all out it may take time to get to where it seems like you're all in but you've got to be pursuing that it's not a well i'm gonna i'm gonna set aside 15 minutes today just to work on my relationship with god no it doesn't work that way we need that 15 minutes a focus time, but we need to be working on that relationship and think God will put thoughts and concepts in our brains that all about Him. So let's let's sum up what we've done as we as we get closer to closing this out. Jesus began to reveal himself as Messiah through his inaugural sign. Water turned to wine at the wedding feast, and through his claim that he would rise after three days, and claim a claim that we know. He accomplished by resurrection. You know, Christians celebrate two huge events in their spiritual walk. I think we need a third, um, and I'll get to that. But we celebrate Christmas, the, the, the birth of Jesus. And then we celebrate Easter, the resurrection, the death and resurrection of Jesus to, to seal the deal, basically, to the end game, um, to give us all uh, something else. I think we ought to celebrate the day we accept Christ as an anniversary or a birthday every year. I think it's a really cool concept that we may want to adapt someday or the day we were baptized to signify that. Um, you know, we celebrate anniversaries, our wedding anniversary, which we talk about weddings here um, as a very, very important part of our lives. It is. I mean, I can still remember seeing my bride walk down the aisle and looking at her when she got up on the platform with me and we, our eyes gazed at the first time. I remember that day vividly. But do we remember the day we accepted Christ? Do we remember the day that we were baptized? Do we remember the day that we said yes? And should we re realize that day more and more? I, I was a, a youth minister in Florida, uh, First Baptist Church to Funiac Springs, back just out of seminary. And one of the, one of the youth, uh, we, we baptized one of the youth on a Sunday morning uh, they're a Filipino family, the Pickards, and I remember um, the, their mom was about five foot nothing, and um, she grabbed me, 
um, the week after he accepted Christ, one of the boys, um, one of our boys, and said, um, "We're going to have a party after church when he's baptized. You're coming, you and your wife." We said, "Yes, ma'am." He didn't say no to her, but they had a celebration. I mean, it was a party um, of celebrating new life, new birth, the symbolism of baptism. They knew what had gone on in his life before, but baptism had a special place in that family, and they celebrated that. Um, I mean, it was a it was a three hour deal. Um, and so it was just exciting to be a part of that, to see how some, coming from a little bit different cultural background, but how they partied and celebrated salvation. And shouldn't we do that as well? We do that more and more in churches today than I did growing up. You know, now when somebody comes forward and we know that they've accepted Christ, we cheer for them. We, we're excited for them. And so that's what it's about. He is after our hearts, and He's after our true worship. Rather than making Him a means to an end, He wants true fellowship with us. In other words, we don't accept Christ just for fire insurance. It's about a day-to-day -day relationship. Because when we have that relationship, we're supposed to tell others. That's what it says in Matthew 28. It says, as you go through life, tell others about who Jesus is. Make disciples. Because we should be so excited because we have the best. We don't have a good thing. We have the best thing. And then Jesus wants to reveal more and more of himself to us. But we must choose to receive him and obey him and trust his timing. In other words, he's going to have us do things we may not know the end. We just have to trust him with that step and then the next step and the next step. And so let me, let me end with this question. Are you willing to give Jesus the opportunity to show you more by giving him more of you even when the timing doesn't seem to fit? Even when he is asking you to do something that doesn't make sense. You know, are you willing to take that step today? What is God asking you to do today? Right now, whenever you're watching this, whether it's on the internet or on TV or wherever it's being broadcasted or whenever you're watching it, what is God asking you to do right now? What small step of faith, what small step of obedience is God challenging you and asking you to take? Because when we take that step, God's going to ask you to do something else. Just be ready. But you're going to know a little bit more of who He is. And you're going to love Him even a little bit more each and every step you take with Him. God, we thank You so much for today and the opportunity we've had to study Your Word. We know that you want true fellowship with us and you want us to take steps of faith with you, of obedience. Even though we may not know what's going on around us or where we're going, we just know we're following you because you are the best option. There may be a lot of good options out there that we think are good, but there's only one best, and that is following you, serving you, being obedient to you. And so God, during... Even today, as we are just taking a moment, may we focus on that. And may we look for moments and times throughout our day to have true fellowship with you, whether it's driving down the road, sitting at our desk, on a job site, walking around the factory, working, out on the farm or wherever we may be that we will find times to fellowship with you and make that part of our everyday existence so that as we breathe in and as we breathe out, we are communing and having fellowship and community with you. So God, thank you for this lesson today. Challenge us and help us to be more and more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us today. We're just so excited that you chose to spend some time with us as we uh, study God's Word. And as we continue, we know that, that fellowship and community is very important. And so we invite you to each and every week at 1030, whether it's online or in person, you, you join us for worship. Um, at 1030 Sunday mornings, you can be 
in your home or you can be here with us in person. We'd love to have you. We have Bible studies at, at 915 as well that we have groups for you. We just want to connect with you in a more personable way. And so may God continue to guide you and bless you on your journey. And we'll see you again next